thank you all for coming, um, students, faculty, guests, uh, especially because we have a visitor from Michigan here, I just want to point out that this is our idea, idea of bad winter weather, and yet we've still got people out. So um, welcome to all of you. My name is Ann Stevens. I'm professor of economics, and I'm director of the new Center for Poverty Research at UC Davis. The um, Center for Poverty Research is one of three federally funded national research centers on poverty. Um, and our goal is to support and disseminate academic research relating to poverty and inequality in the U.S. One of our core themes at the center relates to the critical role of education as a pathway out of poverty for the current generation as well as for future generations. Um, part of this research agenda understands and, and emphasizes that maintaining access to higher education particularly in today's atmosphere of rising inequality, shrinking public sector support, is a critical issue and one that we need continued discussion on. So without further delay, I want to go ahead and get this important discussion started. Uh, it's my pleasure right now to turn over the podium and really the event to uh, the organizer, my colleague, Professor Nicole Curlander from the School of Education, and she will introduce the speakers and um, get our discussion started. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I would like to start by introducing our chancellor, who will make some introductory remarks, and then we actually have some students who will be introducing our panelists today. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Chancellor Linda Katehi. Uh, chancellor Katehi became the sixth chancellor of UC Davis in 2009. As the university's chief executive officer, she oversees all aspects of the university's teaching, research, and public service mission. Chancellor Katehi Holds UC, also holds UC Davis faculty appointments in electric and computer engineering, electrical and computer engineering, and in women and gender studies. Chancellor Katehi's uh, work on electronic circuit design for wireless communications has earned her 19 US patents and an additional four pending uh, patent applications. Among her many distinctions, she has served as chair for the President's Committee for the National Medal of Science and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In addition to these many accomplishments, Chancellor Katehi has also worked from her earliest days as a faculty member to expand research opportunities for undergraduates and to improve the educational and professional experience of graduate students with an emphasis on women and underrepresented groups. Please join me in welcoming our state chancellor, Linda Katehi. you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Great. And thank you all for being here today um, to, in this first seminar of our new Center for Poverty Research. It's such a great honor, of course, to have uh, this distinguished panel, and you will um, have the students introduce our speakers. And I would like again to thank uh, Senate President Pro Term Daryl Steinberg, a proud UC Davis alum from King Hall. I would like to also thank Professor Dina Dinarski from the University of Michigan and Dean Early from Bolt Hall. When UC Davis uh, was announced as one of the three universities elected last September for a federally funded poverty research center, we all became so proud of this accomplishment and so excited because it is very important work on one end, but also because UC Davis has so many things to offer. The title of the seminar today, for example, is, uh, goes exactly to the heart of the problem that we are dealing with every day here on our campus. We all know what great opportunities a UC education can open up for a young person when she or he tries to curve a, a career, lead a productive life, and find ways to contribute to the society. It is always so gratifying when I talk with our students here in California and around the U.S and hear about the wonderful things that they have done or plan to do in their lives, and also hear them say how much they attribute this success to the experiences they've had on our campus or other UC campuses. And so I'm very concerned, as uh, I'm sure you all are, that we are pricing more and more kids out of the UC education and out of this great experience that our campuses uh, have been providing. Tuition on our campuses has gone up substantially in the last four years, and programs have been cut or totally eliminated. We have tightened our belts, we have become more efficient, but we are still not accessible to enough deserving students. 
Much of the reason for this is because the state has been unable to invest in higher education for some time due to serious budget shortfalls. In 1980, 17% of the state budget went to higher education, but today, less than 10% goes to higher education. The gap between the demands of our economy and the supply of college-educated workers poses a serious threat to the state's economic future. Income inequality is greater in California than any other state in the Union, and it's getting worse every day. As the demand for higher skilled workers increases in an innovation-based economy, employment prospects for Californians with low education levels will be even lower than they are today. And of course, I know I'm speaking to the choir. We're here today to talk about these problems and try to find possible solutions. But um, I also have to thank uh, Senator Steinberg for all of the work that he has done in support of higher education. I just want to bring to uh, your attention a very recent proposal that he has drafted to subsidize the cost of textbooks for college students. And I have to tell you, being a mother of two students who went to college, I, cannot, uh, ima I, mean, I could not believe the increase in the cost of those textbooks and how such a program can benefit all of you and all the students on our campuses. So I would like to thank him for that. We also have to find a way to get other legislators and policymakers to work together to plan and implement strategies that will strengthen and revitalize California's higher education system. And finally, I believe we have to do a better job of engaging the general public in this discussion and in this effort. We are the public. We have to come together and ask ourselves whether we have given enough tools to the state government to be able to fund education, to fund higher education, and to uh, identify the priorities and the needs we have today. And so we need to have those extensive discussions. We need to be engaged. We need to come and reaffirm our commitment to education being so important to the future of this state. And also we need to remind everyone that even if they do not have children in college or they do not have children who will go to college, still colleges and universities in the state are part of our future and we need to invest in them. So I'm so delighted to be here today. I'm so delighted to be, uh, to participate in the first uh, seminar of this wonderful center. And I would like to thank all of our speakers. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Eileen Smith. I'm a fourth year community and regional development major here at UC Davis and it is my honor to introduce Senator Steinberg. Daryl Steinberg was elected to the California Senate in 2006 after six years in the State Assembly representing the Sacramento Capital Region. He was elected by his fellow senators to lead the State Senate as the President Pro Temp in 2008. Senator Steinberg has been an advocate on issues of poverty, health, and schooling throughout his legislative career, including efforts to add resources to high poverty schools, reforming foster care, and expanding community mental health programs. Senator Steinberg has authored legislation to increase the focus of career technical training in California schools and to better align higher education with high priority industry sectors in the state. Like the Chancellor mentioned, most recently he proposed legislation to reduce textbook costs for undergraduate courses through digital open source course material. Senator Steinberg did his education in our state's great higher education system, earning a BA in economics from UCLA and his JD from UC Davis's law school. He is no stranger to activism on this campus, leading a campaign as a law student himself to make the moot courtroom wheelchair accessible long before the American with Disabilities Act made it a requirement. A devoted supporter of public higher education in the state of California, please help me welcome Senator Steinberg. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. Uh, you did your homework. Uh, <laughs> go back to 1984, and uh, I, I won't tell the whole story, but suffice it to say that my first taste of political activism, the thing that inspired me to actually consider a life or a career in public service was my time at UC Davis fighting on behalf of 
students with disabilities, and with plenty of abilities, by the way, who merely wanted to practice their trial practice in a real courtroom, as opposed to a, a downstairs class. And it was a struggle, but that turned me on. And it has led to uh, many, many more opportunities. And I thank you, and I, I thank the, uh, the Poverty Research Project, Chancellor Katehi. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you for your nice words, and it's great to be with my friend Dean Edley uh, on a on this sort of a panel, Professor Donarski, I look forward to hearing you as well. Let me um, tell you just a tiny bit about myself because it leads to what I want to talk about. I'm actually the alumni of three University of Californias. I started at UC Berkeley, transferred to UCLA, and then did my law work, as Eileen said, at UC Davis. And the date I entered college at UC, I only have eight to go, by the way, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to wait, so we'll see. The time I entered UC Berkeley was a very interesting time. I started in November of 19, in September, excuse me, of 1977. Seven months later, seven months later, California voters passed Proposition 13, which changed public finance forever and changed the way public education and our higher education university system has been seen and, frankly, has operated. Now, it took a little while for the impact of Prop 13 to be felt. And I think I caught the tail end, if you will, of the good times where I was able to finish my undergraduate education in four years, go to law school, never had a question about getting classes. It was reasonably affordable. And I was able to begin my adult life with a terrific higher education experience. And of course, there's a lot that has gone on between then and now. And I want to say to you, as the Occupy movement uh, has taken root throughout campuses throughout this country and in California, that there is no question that the origins of the Occupy movement and what underlies it has a direct link, has a direct link to what's going on on campus today. More specifically, the Wall Street scandal of 2008 that had been building for many years has a direct connection to the challenges our universities and its students are facing today. Because it was in 2008 when the economy began to collapse. I hope you've all read Too Big to Fail and have read some of the other excellent literature and books on what occurred. I became the pro tem of the Senate in December of 2008. And within months of my ascension, in fact, within about a month of my accession, accession, ascension, <coughs> easy for you to say, <laughs> California's budget deficit ballooned to $42 billion. And I recognize we're talking about a base budget of about $100 billion. $42 billion, never heard of before. <coughs> Almost half of the general fund budget was in deficit. And so the statistics that I'm about to read with you are stark, and I want to read them to you for two purposes. Number one, to give you a sense of the big picture, but also to let you know that as righteous as your cause is, as students, as faculty members, as higher education leaders, in fighting for more funding for higher education, and in fighting for a reduction in fees, you don't stand alone here in terms of the suffering that has gone on throughout this state. In November 2007, the legislative analyst, the expert financial entity, said that in this budget year, we would have $133 billion worth of resources. The current projection for 2012-2013 is $86 billion, a 35% reduction. 
Unemployment in California is not expected to hit pre-recession levels until 2016. State revenues are not expected to go back to that 2007-8 peak until 2014-15. Higher education has been hit horribly hard. A $3 billion decrease across the three systems, 20% since 2007 and 8. Fee increases, of course, have skyrocketed. In, in 7 8, at the UC system, it was 5,600. Now it's 11,200. That's a 100% increase. We know what that means. I know what that means to students and their families, people struggling to make ends meet and to do what I consider to be kind of a, a basic step in life in 1977 to go to college and to get, and to get an education. But that's not all. SSI, SSP grants for the most severely disabled people in our society have been cut to 1983 levels. CalWORKs grants for poor families and children are at 1987 levels. CalWORKs is the single best assistance to work program in the country, by the way, where people get some help on the child care <coughs> end, on the work training end. They get a modest grant. And there's a requirement that you go find a job or get educated to try to find a job. Report yesterday, two days ago in the newspaper, said that over the past five years, for those people on CalWORKs, getting that grant because we've reduced it, because we've reduced childcare. There's been a 98% increase in homelessness among people actually receiving assistance. Spending on K-12 schools has dropped from 55.6 billion in 7-8 to 47.6 billion this year. And so I often think to myself, a uh, heck of a time to become the leader. <laughs> but one colleague uh, who I have great respect for, a veteran of the legislature, once said to me, you know, Daryl, it's much more fun to serve during good times, but it may be much more important to serve during the difficult and bad times because we are still standing and you're still here and the universities have not closed down. The challenges are great. And the question for you, the question for the Occupy movement, the question for all of us is how do we take the anger, the energy, the passion, the, in the intellect, and how do we put it together and create an agenda that actually makes change and leads to tangible results? Now, it's not for me as a politician, bad word, I know, I'm actually proud of it, to tell you what the agenda of the student should be. That's really the student's choice and the people who choose to get involved. But I will say to you this, effective organizing, effective political advocacy is about focus. It is about picking one or two or three things that matter. And even if it doesn't change the entire world, it changes a big part of the world and changes lives for the better. So let me suggest three things very quickly that we can rally around together and make a difference for you and for the people who will come after you. <clears throat> Both the Chancellor and Eileen reference this textbook issue. And you know this better than anyone. The cost of a Statistics 1 textbook? What is it? $244 was what I was quoted. Somebody told me today the physics textbook that includes all the online material that you have to buy is over $200. And you can't buy a used book because that doesn't give you the access then to get online. The prices for instructional materials are so great that if we brought down those costs in the way I want to describe in a moment significantly, those cost savings would be greater, at least in two out of the three higher education systems, than the fee increases which are going into, have gone into effect and are going into effect this year. And yet, you guys probably, you know, do what you have to do. You write the check and, oh my God, well, it's just the cost of doing business. It's not fair and it's not right. Why is it that there's only one choice for students? Why is it that that choice isn't the standard for 
five years or ten years and that, you have, and that the next year you have to buy an updated version at the same price. The stories are legendary. Let me tell you what I think we should do. I don't think the state should take over the development of textbooks. We've got our own problems. And, and I don't necessarily subscribe to the notion that the state or government does it any better. But here's what I think. Competition, in this instance, is a good thing. My bill says the following. Let's put out, let's take the top 50 courses across all three systems, community colleges, undergraduate courses, CSU, community colleges, and UC. And let's put out what we call in the business a request for proposals to foundations, to publishers themselves, to the Silicon Valley, to the nonprofit world, the foundation world, you name it. And ask the bidders to come on in and show us what they can produce in each of these 50 courses that demonstrates equal or higher quality than what's being done now at $20 or less per course. Online, interactive, with the ability to print the online version and have a hard copy if you need it. No monopoly, no state taking over, a competitive process that drives down the price and maintain and enhances the quality. Now, there's some folks that are kind of freaking out about this. And it's a good thing. Because the world's changing. Technology is obviously much different and much more advanced than it was even 10 years ago. And there is no reason why, why in the era of ever-increasing fees and high costs of living, that a student should have to pay $244 for a statistic textbook. It isn't right, and we're going to make this a fight. And if you want to rally around something this year that is specific, that is real, that can bring down the costs, we got plenty of room on our, on our train here, and we need your help. Because those who will oppose this will have every reason and excuse to not want to move in this direction. They'll say they're already doing it. Yeah they're charging 90, 100 bucks for the online materials. And then, oh, by the way, it, it disappears online after a specific period of time. That's one. Number two, hold people like my feet to the fire that when the economy begins to improve, that the first place we reinvest is higher education. That's my promise to you. I'll stand here and say that. We are on the verge of an economic recovery. I can see around the corner, but we're not quite turned the corner. The governor has proposed a $7 billion tax increase, mostly on upper income earners, for the November ballot. You want to get involved in something real and concrete that is going to mitigate the need for any more cuts and hopefully allow us to begin restoring? Get involved in that campaign on campus and help spread the word. Finally. I could talk an hour on each of these, by the way. <laughs> Finally, recognize the link and get involved in helping change the nature of high school in California. Too many young people dropping out. And too many college students having to take remedial English and remedial math because the high school education didn't quite prepare them enough. I believe in high standards and rigor. We need to maintain them. You know what else I believe? We have the ability to think about how to teach core academic courses in high school in ways that are applied towards career pathways. Why can't algebra be taught in a way that prepares you for a biotechnology career, or a construction career, or a career as an engineer? Why can't history be taught in a way that prepares you for the culinary, for, for culinary arts, and uh, to be a world-class world-class chef. We have the ability to transform high school to make it more career-oriented, and the UC is at the center of that, because the UC defines A to G. And this is another issue that I suggest to you might be one ripe for political activism for people who are looking to take that energy, take that passion, take that anger, and put it into something that could make a real difference for you and the people who come after you. 
I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Tracy Regis. I'm an undergraduate student studying economics, and I'm delighted to introduce Professor Susan Dynarski. Susan Dynarski is an Associate Professor of Education and Public Policy at the University of Michigan. She is a Faculty Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and has been a visiting fellow at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and Princeton University. She is an editor of the Journal of Labor Economics and Education Finance and Policy. Professor Dynarski's research focuses on charter schools, demand for private schooling, historical trends in inequality and educational attainment, and the optimal design of financial aid. Her previous research explored the impact of grants and loans on educational attainment and the consequences of tax incentives for college saving. Dynarski is a national expert on college access and affordability and has testified to the U.S. Senate Finance Committee, the U.S. House Ways and Means Committee, and the President's Commission on Tax Reform. Please join me in welcoming Professor Susan Dynarski on our campus. Thanks for having me. Somebody was going to turn this on, right? It's on. It's on. Yeah, wake up. Wake it up. I'll start talking. So I'm an economist. Um, I study education policy. I became an economist because I was interested in inequality. Um, I, uh, before I was an economist, uh, I never thought I'd grow up to be an economist. Who wants to grow up to be an economist? <laughs> if you are, I don't want to. I don't want to party with you. Uh, 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 I was um, a union organizer uh, uh, for six years. I organized secretaries uh, at, un at, um, at universities uh, into into unions, uh, and I become interested because I saw unions as a way for for um, uh, people to rise out of poverty, uh, uh, income mobility, uh, a, a way to to, to get. Um, um, from uh, the working class into the, the middle class. Uh, and um, before I was a union organizer, well, I was a college student. Um, and I was a first generation college graduate in my family. My dad was a, was a high school dropout. And I had seen the, the transformative power of education. I mean, I know I ended up where I am because I went to college. Um, and so education, just like unions, are a vehicle um, for, for economic mobility in this country. So what I'm going to um, show you today are some, some facts that help me organize my thinking about education, about the finance of education, about how important it is, and um, um, some facts that I hope can help sort of ground our, um, our thinking about um, uh, the challenges that you face here and the challenges that we face nationwide. So uh, the question here, which I'm sure is in your minds and you want to know the answer to it, is, is college worth it? Right? In the face of, of rising tuition prices, rising loan debt, is college really pay off, or would you be better off just not going to college at all? So the economists brought graphs. This one's <laughs> tough to look at. I'll show you a bigger one in a second. This is median earnings, um, uh, and it goes from 1971 uh, to 2008. On the left are females. <coughs> on the right are males. Let me just zoom into one of these so we can look at it. So here's the males. The line on the top are people with a BA, people who've earned a BA. Next line down, uh, people who have some college or an AA. Next line down, the gray one, high school graduates. And then all the way at the bottom, high school dropouts. Okay, so the main thing you see here is that just at, all of them are going down, except for the one on the top, right? So, uh, and even that, for men, is kind of level. We're kind of back where we were. This is real earnings. It's deflated, you know, infl all that stuff, right? So it's about where we were back in 1971. Right, so the, the earnings of, high school, of college graduates are about where they were in 71. However, tuition prices are up. So one way to think about it is that if your parent was a, was a, was a college graduate and you're going to be a college graduate, um, uh, you're going to be somewhat worse off because you're going to be paying more in tuition. But the other thing to look at is you know, one way that uh, you, you might not say it's the best time to ever, ever to be a college graduate. It's the worst time ever not to be a college graduate would be a good way to look at it because look at these lines. Right? Real incomes have been dropping for everybody except college graduates for the past 30 years, okay? more than 30 years. So, and that difference between the people on the bottom and the people on the top, that gap, compare that gap there versus there, that's growing inequality. Right? So this is one dimension along which inequality has been growing in our country is across income groups. So one thing I want to, 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 to say to you, it is important to go to college because otherwise instead of being on that blue line, you're on this gray line. But the other thing to, say, to, to remember is, thank God you're not in the gray line, okay? <laughs> so in 
So the funding for college, the funding for education, comes from the entire tax base, which includes the people on the bottom. Right? And so when we're talking about how we pay for college, one reason why people, economists tend to think that people should be helping to pay for the college, their college education, is that they're going to end up on that blue line. And if you didn't pay for it, then the person on the gray line is going to be paying for it. And that's not very nice either, because <laughs> their, their lives are economically not going so great. Okay, so uh, there's a context here to, to think about. Uh, this is females, looking a little better. Women are better off than they were in 1971, but in, in, and for the rest of the population, basically flat. Um, uh, but for men especially, inequality has gone up a lot. Now, economists tend to think about student loans as sort of a, um, a not necessarily a bad thing. I had some student loans that I had to take out to go through college. I paid them off. Um, uh, the point of loans is that you reach forward into the earnings that you're going to have when you're 40 or 50 and use them to pay for the investment that you're going to be making right now for college. Right? That's supposed to be the idea. What this picture is, is the cumulative earnings of um, uh, over the lifetime between age you know, 18 and 64. Take each year's earnings and add them up, netting out the tuition costs that you'd have to pay if you were, if you were going to college. Right? So, um, you know, if you're, um, uh, if you're not going to college, you start working right at 18, and your earnings are going up along that gray line. So you start out earning more if you don't go to college, because you're working and making some money, right? Uh, these college students here aren't making any money. But the line crosses pretty quick, around age 32. And as you can see, lifetime, the gap in earnings between somebody who finishes college and somebody who doesn't go to college is, oh, you know, $300,000. That's net of typical loan payments and net of tuition costs, okay? So in short, that's the answer to the question of, is college still worth it? Yes. Over the lifetime, somebody who goes to college versus somebody who uh, stops at high school is going to end up earning net of their costs over the course of their lifetime an additional $400,000 or so, okay? So yes, it is still worth it. This is not guaranteed. It's not a sure bet. Right, this is the median, right? So some people are there's no sure bets, but college is one of the better sure better bets these days. Um, uh, it's certainly better than Vegas. Fine <laughs> um, uh, print, okay. Uh, debt uh, has it been getting worse? Has student loan debt been getting worse? This is ninety nine two thousand. This is oh eight oh nine. I don't see a trend here. Okay, so <laughs> this is the percentage of students borrowing fifty four percent here, fifty five percent here. Uh, um, the um, uh, smaller line is uh, average over um, uh, all bachelor's degree recipients. The average is about $11,000, and it's been there for a long time. Right? So average uh, debt levels of bachelor's degree recipients coming out of public four-year institutions is about $11,000. If you just look at the people who actually borrow, it's about $20,000. About half of people borrow. Okay? So we're not seeing a huge spike here. Okay? There are um, uh, proprietary schools, people who go to um, very expensive schools can end up with very high debt loads. This is the median. The mean doesn't look all that different. Okay, so there are some people way out in the tails who are taking out a lot of money, but the typical person is not, and about half of people are not taking out any at all. Okay, this is then uh, what the debt payment would look like if you took out, uh, to get your public BA, if you took out 20,000 bucks a year, and you took the typical payment, it would be a, a schedule, 10 years, you'd be paying 228 a month. Okay? With that level of debt, you're actually eligible for the 20-year um, uh, payoff, which is what I did, because when I got out of school, I was totally freaked out, and 228 scared me. So I went for the 150, and I'm still paying my loan. Sally Mae gets a check from me every month, right? But 151, you know, it's, here's my way of comparison. Okay, average new car loan in the US, when people buy a new car. Typical loan they take out is $24,000. You can't pay for a car over 20 years. They won't let you do that, right? You gotta do it maybe over five years and at 3%, 431 bucks, okay? The reason you can pay off over 10 or 20 years is that it's paying off over, you know, it's understood that when you get an education, it's paying off till you die, till you leave the labor force, right? So it's a long-term investment. You pay it off over the long term, right? Nobody suggests that we should be paying off our houses over five years. A house is, a, is an investment that we get benefits from for, for years and years and years, you get out a 30-year mortgage. So I tend to think we should have like 30-year mortgages in our student loans. Because when you're in the first 10 years out of college, it's when your earnings are most unstable. 
right? You're in that, you're trying out different jobs, you're checking things out. The idea that students should be paying off their loans when they're in their 20s, I think is a silly idea. You should be able to spread it out until your earnings are actually somewhere serious, like when you're in your 40s or so. So um, uh, that doesn't, uh, and here's the, um, all right, so you're taking out loans because tuition, uh, because there's tuition. So what does tuition look like? Um, great transition, right? So um, uh, at the public four-year in-state average uh, across the U.S., about $7,600. Is it about 10 here now? Is that right? Okay, so 76, you guys used to be below the average. Now you're above the average. Average is 76. Um, and over one year, it went up by about 8%. I study financial aid a lot. And this is sort of a key point I want to get up and bring into the conversation here, which is those were sticker prices. And the sticker prices are not what most people are paying. Um, the majority of students are not paying the sticker price at any institution. They're getting some form of aid, whether it's a grant or whether it's a loan. Uh, there's also tax credits and deductions that people are getting, right? So if we take that into account, this is also kind of hard to look at. I'll, I'll zoom on this as well. This is, we've got 95, 96, 001. 05, 06, 10, 11. The, um, the purple are room and board costs. The dark orange is uh, the um, uh, uh, published tuition and fees. And the light orange is the net tuition and fee cost, net of financial aid that people are getting. Okay? And so this is public four years, four different years. And what you see, so what you see basically here is that if anything, you know, so the sticker price, the dark orange, is going up. The sticker price is going up. That's what I showed you, the 8% in one year, for example. So that's going up. The light orange line is the one that's net of aid, federal aid, state aid, the tuition tax credits. That has gotten smaller. So net price is actually down. For, the, for, the, for those people who are not paying the sticker price, the college, the total cost of college has actually been going down. If you're someone whose family is well off enough that you don't get any financial aid, the cost has been going up. Okay, so uh, for people uh, in the middle to the bottom of the income distribution, if anything, the price is going down somewhat. And for those at the upper end of the income distribution, it's rising. Right? So there's greater price discrimination now in financial aid than there once was. Right? So California used to have a model of basically cheap for everybody. And now we're moving to a model in which the tuition is getting higher and the need-based aid, the aid that's targeted on low-income kids, sorry, you're not kids, you're young adults, uh, the, the aid that's, that's targeted on young adults uh, uh, from poor families is going up as well. So where everyone used to be paying a certain price, now you're getting this gradient where some people are paying a lot more than other people. Right, um, and this sort of shows this for 07, 08, we've got income groups, dependent, I'm gonna focus on the dependent um, uh, uh, families, Lowest income quartile, highest income quartile. This is like 100,000 and up is the highest income quartile. Let me just show you what they, where is it? Uh, yeah, highest is 100 or up, lowest is below 32. Okay, all right, yeah, is that right to the, uh, yeah. All right, so um, uh, again, the, um, uh, uh, the total grants is the light purple, the uh, dark purple, is the net tuition and fees, how much you have to pay out of pocket net of all the aid. And basically, there is no dark purple over here, because if you're in the lowest income group, there is no net cost. It's completely covered by, um, uh, uh, by, um, uh, by the grants, uh, and it's going up with income. So once you're in the highest group, uh, if you're going in-state, it's averaging out of pocket about $4,300. Okay? So um, uh, uh, for out-of-state, everything's a bit higher, but the pattern is similar. Basically, the, the net price for those in the lowest quartile is, is the lowest. This is what I want to close with. You know, the model that California used to have of cheap for everybody was based on a, a compact, where those who went to college did well, made lots of money, then turned around and paid high taxes and paid it back for the next generation, which allowed us to have cheap higher education. What's been changing in the U.S., another graph, right? It's like, what is on the y-axis? What's on the x-axis here, right? <laughs> Were you an econ major? I was. Okay, all right. <laughs> I just forgot it all. All right. All right. You probably had big classes. And did you buy the textbook? I borrowed it. All right. So this is a change in the top marginal tax rate 
for those in the top 1% of the income distribution. So how it changed over time between the 70s and the 2000s. So going in this direction, negative, is that the rate is dropping quite a bit. So there's the US. The rate of uh, taxation on the top income earners has dropped about 30 percentage points. Not percent, points. Okay? Uh, something similar in UK. Right? So basically we have stopped, well not stopped, but we have massively decreased the amount of taxation that we place on the highest earners. That was the money that was being used to pay it forward that was used to invest in education, to invest in K-12 education, to invest in college. And it's not happening. So it's turning more into a pay your own way. You know, if you're going to benefit from college later on, pay now with a loan, um, uh, uh, by working, uh, where it used to be instead basically an intergenerational compact. And now it's a, the compact is with yourself. You're going to benefit from it later on. You pay for it right now. If we want to go back to the old model, we got to leave this model because it's not affordable given the current, um, the, the current arrangement. And that is, and there's my sources, okay, footnotes, and that's it. So I look forward to hearing uh, the additional comments. Thank you, Professor Janarski. Uh, my name is Manuelito, and I'm a doctoral candidate in education policy here at UC Davis. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Christopher Edley today. Christopher Edley Jr. is Dean and Professor of Law at Bolt Hall, University of California Berkeley School of Law. He was a Professor of Law at Harvard Law School for 23 years, where he founded the Harvard Civil Rights Project, a multidisciplinary think tank focused on racial ethnic justice. Edley served in President Carter's administration as Assistant Director of the White House Domestic Policy Staff and as a Senior Advisor on Economic Policy for President Bill Clinton. In 1995, he was also special counsel to President Clinton, directing the White House Review of, the, of Affirmative Action. He later served the Clinton White House in 1997 as a consultant to the President's Advisory Board on the Race Initiative. Edley was a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights from 1999 to 2005, and in 2007, Edley was elected as a fellow into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2009, Edley became special advisor to the University of California President Mark Udoff and was appointed to the 20-member Commission of the Future to make recommendations regarding the University of California's long-term strategy for sustaining its mission. So please join me in welcoming Professor Chris Fred. Thank you very much. Uh, Well, those are two tough acts to follow, and uh, so I won't bother. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the dominant ranking of research universities in the world is produced by Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, it's a fairly serious piece of work. And for the last several years, uh, this survey, uh, this ranking of the top 500 research universities in the world, of the top 50 in the world, of the top 50 in the world, there are seven UC campuses. Seven UC campuses. And at the same time, 42% of undergraduates at UC are Pell recipients. That is astonishing. To have that kind of world-class excellence, but also provide opportunity, it just doesn't happen anywhere else on this planet. The question, of course, is whether or not we'll be able to say the same thing in 5, 10, 15 years. And uh, I am optimistic, but only on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> With the retreat of public support, and it's not only in California, I think it is perhaps most painful in California because uh, the past was so golden. But with the retreat on public support for higher education, 
uh, and this changed financial environment, the challenge of providing both excellence and access uh, has really become, uh, in my mind, dire. You can use the, the, uh, the cliche about the slowly warming pot of water uh, with the frog in it, and eventually the frog is boiled to death. Well, slowly, over the last several of years, over the last several years, some of the indicators of quality at the University of California have been in decline. Student-faculty ratios, the accumulating uh, stock of, of uh, uh, maintenance and renovation, deferred maintenance, uh, the increased use of non-ladder faculty, uh, the declining proportion of qualified California residents who are able to find their way onto UC campuses. The master plan is being slowly shredded as if we were the frogs in a slowly warming pot of water. So you can tell today is neither Tuesday nor Thursday. <laughs> One of the things that was striking to me when I served on the Commission on the Future of the University was the, the uh, projection that in 10 years there'll be roughly 40,000 UC eligible students finishing our high schools. Uh, with no room for them on UC campuses. Yet it's clear that with our current production model, we simply can't afford more bricks and mortar to build more UC campuses and serve that 40,000 additional students each year. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do about access and what are we going to do about excellence? And the answer has to be finding more revenue. Now, it's interesting. When I came eight years ago, and it seems like only eight decades, <laughs> when I came eight years ago, uh, and I wanted to hire more faculty, and I had raised tuition at the law school, and I wanted to use the tuition to hire more faculty, I was told, oh, no, 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 there's a, there's a rule in the university. There's a rule that when you hire faculty, you have to pay for them with state funds, because state funds are the most secure, and that's the way of guaranteeing the faculty that there'll be a paycheck for them. Well, uh, no. <laughs> the, most volatile re the most volatile revenue stream I have is the state appropriation. The most secure revenue stream I have is the tuition that I charge our students. This has just completely turned things on its head where the state is not, as I, I, as I have tried to explain to my alumni, uh, uh, this is, it's, it's not really a public law school in the financial sense. In the mission sense, yes. But in the financial sense, it's really more a publicly encouraged law school, uh, <laughs> not a publicly funded law school. And that is the reality, with, that's the reality with which we have to deal. Try to provide excellence, try to provide access in a radically changed environment. And I'll come back to the whys in a moment. Second thing I want to talk about is not UC, but K-12. Uh, and, I, and I have to talk about K-12, not just because it's a pipeline to the university, but because this event is being hosted by this fabulous new center to work on poverty issues. And as important as higher education is in our opportunity engine, it's built upon a K-12 system. Now, uh, I was appointed a year ago, uh, roughly a year ago, to co-chair a national commission created by Congress on K-12 excellence and equity. So I'm chairing this commission. In fact, I have a meeting in Washington on Monday. And our charge is to, well, fix it. <laughs> in working with researchers, so we, so this, so we got 30 people on this commission. We've got a, a, a fabulous education researchers. We've got the president of the two national teachers unions. We've got the, the head of the NAACP, the head of the Urban League, the head of MALDEF. Uh, we've got a state commissioner of education for this state and that state. I mean, it's all the stakeholders are there. And they know too much. This is my, my problem as a as a as co-chair. My my co-chair is uh, Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix. 
who hasn't been around that much. Uh, <laughs> busy losing a billion dollars a month, I think. But here's the issue. Here's the issue. At a moment when the changes in the economy make education all the more important, against many international indicators, we're in decline. And the disparities in education attainment and achievement are now widening again. And to address that, we have 15,000 school districts. 15,000 school <coughs> districts, right? 1,000 in California alone. A 19th century model of governance and finance for education. For education in a global economy in which we're competing with countries, with societies that value their teachers, that value education attainment far more than we do in the United States and far more than California today. In a fundamental sense, this is not just about the policy plumbing. It's not, just about, it's not just about additional investments. It's about changing our values to create the political predicate, the moral predicate, for reinvesting in both K-12 and in higher education. So I want to close by just saying a little bit about what UC can do. Well, first of all, I'm an academic. It's true that I spend most of my time trying to raise money, but I'm an academic. And ideas are what we do. None of these problems, repairing K-12 education, early childhood learning, inventing new modes of delivering higher education that are affordable in our new context, these are researchable questions. And it requires great research universities with a public mission to engage those questions. Yes, we're needed to work on climate change. We're needed to work on immigration reform. We're needed to work on translational medicine and biotechnology. But we're also needed to work on school reform, on improving higher education. That's at the core of our mission as a great public university. And it's at the core of the mission, I suggest, for this new, wonderful Center for Poverty Research, because education is at the heart of the Opportunity Engine. Second thing that UC can do. I am convinced in my marrow that the only way in which we're going to be able to preserve excellence and provide access to tens of thousands of additional students as California is browning, the only way we're going to be able to do that is with some reinvention of the way we deliver instruction. So the question is, how, can we, how can we continue to provide education that is UC quality, but that takes, advantages of, that takes advantage of new technologies in order to deliver that high quality instruction in a more cost effective way? I'm not talking about getting rid of the bricks and mortar model. I'm not talking about changing dramatically what happens on our 10 fabulous campuses. But I'm worried about how we're going to provide access to all of these other students that we can't fit on our campuses, but who are every bit as qualified to be there. Society can't afford to say to those tens of thousands of students, that's OK, you don't need a world-class education. We can only afford to give you something less. Good luck. We can't afford that. That's why I'm putting a lot of time into working on online education and trying to create a world-class <coughs> form for highly interactive, high-touch online education that will work for students who may not be willing to be full-time students on a campus that's far away from home. That may not work for what's going on in their lives. Something where we can take our best professors, our best lecturers, our best modelers to create computer simulations, inexpensive but high quality e-textbooks. This is a moment for reinvention because this is a moment of crisis. And we have to experiment. We have to find a way forward 
in the face of all of these uncertainties. And the third and final thing I'll say about what UC has to do is it has to create the next generation of activists. The next generation of folks who are going to go to work on this values proposition I discussed earlier. I'll close with an anecdote. I, uh, back in my childhood, I had a, I had a searing experience. Uh, I was working in the White House uh, for President Clinton, for President Carter. I'm sorry, President Carter. Yeah, Carter. <laughs> I, I was 12 years old at the, at, at the time. And I was in charge of anti-poverty policy and welfare, social security, a bunch of things like that. And that's at a time when welfare reform meant spending more money on poor people. That was a very different era. And I went up to the Hill to lobby a conservative congressman from Georgia <coughs> with my boss. And I went through this song and dance about our $10 billion proposal that I had slaved, putting away, putting, putting together for six months. Fabulous proposal. Brilliant, I might even say. <laughs> and I explained all this and what it was going to do. And this congressman sat back and he said, well, you know, that's very interesting. And it's, I, I can understand. What you, but, but I have to tell you, I'm not hearing a lot from my constituents about welfare reform. And if I asked them about welfare, they'd say, let's cut it. They wouldn't want to spend more money on it. So I'm sorry, I can't be helpful. So I went back, and I was just trying to digest this. How could he be so cold-hearted? How could he not care about these families? How could he not care about lifting people out of poverty? Years later, I figured out what the problem was. The problem was that liberals like me we're talking about poverty policy in terms of the food stamp asset test and the Medicaid matching rate and the, uh, uh, the implied tax rate on benefits and uh, the singer, single earner family. And we were talking about the policy plumbing, whereas the conservatives were talking about the value. They were talking about the values. And it turns out that the American people were not as interested in the plumbing as they were in the values. And so years later, they won, and we lost the welfare entitlement, created another set of programs. The same thing has happened with respect to the commitment to quality education for all. Now, it was always a little aspirational and vaporous. But the basic value proposition that we cannot have the kind of society we want without an education system zero through college that works for all, that basic value proposition has been lost in part because we've been working on the policy plumbing. So as you students prepare yourself to make a difference in the world, you need to do two things. You need to collect the heaviest bag full of tools, intellectual skills, habits of thought, analytical capabilities that you can possibly accumulate on this fabulous campus. And you also need to keep your eye on the values that are at stake in these struggles and become adept at debating them, at engaging them, at persuading people about them. These are skills for life, and never will you have a better opportunity to gain them than what you're doing right now, right here at the University of California. Thank you. Well, I hope uh, this has stimulated a lot of questions from our audience. So we, we have questions. If you can speak up, since there's no mic, but we are taping. And if you could please introduce yourself. Um, and it's OK to reflect on, on the comments, but we'd like to, for people to ask questions in particular. OK, please. Um, this is for the gentleman in the white suit. Uh, now you said. Uh, white suit, that's you. That's you. <laughs> Senator Steinberg, yeah. yes. Not Senator Steinberg. I have, I have a question. Economic meltdown started in 2008. Uh, according to one of my sources, the economic meltdown started in the 80s. Um, according to the book I've been reading, um, what's your take on that?
unfortunately, there's been more than one meltdown. <laughs> the, the trend, I think, for public finance in California actually started in 1978. I think there's little disagreement that the watershed event in California was the passage of Proposition 13 in 1978. You guys all know what Prop 13 is? Or was Prop 13 limited the growth in property tax rates. It used to be that the state of California actually had a fairly minor role in public education and in financing local government. And when Prop 13 passed, local governments and school districts uh, no longer had the financial means to, to fund education and public safety at the same levels. The state helped out uh, but has essentially now taken over the public education system and the funding of county government and to some degree we bailed out the cities as well. <coughs> What's then happened since, I'll try to keep it simple and not digress too much, is that all, a lot of the constituencies in California have gone to the ballot, the same initiative process that brought Prop 13 and they've gained their own protection. K-12 education, for example, has Proposition 98. That requires, essentially, that 40 to 50 percent of every tax dollar, regardless of what source, goes to K-14 education, because it includes community colleges. The transportation community went out and got its lockbox for transportation funding. Local governments did the same thing. Higher education is actually one of the few places in the state budget now that is unprotected by the Constitution. Now, I would not suggest that the solution is to lock up the state budget further by having higher ed go in and do that, but I'll tell you. Tempting though that if is. It, it tem <laughs> tempting, tem tempting though that is. We've got to fix this dysfunction and, and swing that pendulum back from where it has gone since the passage of Prop 13. So, yes, you're correct, but in 2008, the, the spikes and the, the peaks in the valleys, we hit the worst valley we have ever hit because of the fact that all of our revenue sources, the housing market collapsed. The remaining property tax went down like this, income tax, unemployment rose high. We did not receive the stock market, of course, went down. So 2008 was the worst of the ups and downs that we have lived with, certainly since 1978. But many say you go back to the Great Depression to look for a time where the financial system and the economy was as challenge as it has been the last couple of years. Fortunately, we're, as I said, I think we're turning a corner. Questions? Yes, please. Yes, uh, my name's Sean here. I'm a graduate student of sociology here. Um, I have a question. I'm sorry, I came a little late. I missed your name. Uh, the the uh, lady gave the presentation. <coughs> Sue, right. Professor Donarski. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, a, a couple of, first an observation and then a couple of questions. Uh, as a teaching assistant here, I've seen a lot of particularly first-generation uh, students have to leave college because their family was just too stressed uh, economically. Uh, and it was as, I mean, I can think of several examples because of the high tuition increase uh, as of two years ago. Um, and uh, I, I was wondering if your Statistics, I, I mean, you could paint a pretty rosy picture of in terms of low-income students getting financial aid, but um, I, I mean, on the ground, I'm seeing a different thing. I'm seeing a lot of students who were coming from financially stressed families having to leave college or having to delay their education. Um, so I was wondering if you had some comments on that. Also, uh, I... Can I do that one first before yeah, I forget sure. it? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Actually, sociologists are providing some insight um, and theories about what might be going on in the, in the in the case that you the sort of cases you were giving. Because I mean, the price has been going down for low-income students, but I think um, part of what's going on is is blowback from the broadening uh, economic crisis. Uh, in that 
you know, if you're a low-income student and your dad gets laid off, you might get called back to come work to help support the rest of the family, right? So we may well be providing enough money for that student to go through college, but we're not providing uh, uh, back to their family uh, the, the earnings that they would be making if they were instead working, right? So um, uh, uh, my guess is that uh, in many of these cases, and, and, and we, we see some evidence of this in the data and also from uh, anecdotes and from um, focus groups, that that's part of what's going on. Uh, you know, you're in your second year of college, um, and you're a young person, and you could be working, and something goes wrong in the family, uh, and you drop out in order to, to help your family through. So um, uh, that, at least, is, is, is part of what um, uh, I think could be going on. Um, you know, the, the um, uh, I'm not usually a rosy person, so uh, <laughs> it's an optimistic uh, spin. You know, I, as, I, as I showed, the net price has been going down for low-income students. In other research that I've been doing, however, I, in policy advocacy, I've been trying to get the financial aid system simplified because I think an awful lot of low-income students don't know what the price could be. And as high school students, they're put off by the headlines they see about tuition prices going up. And they don't know from their perspective, and if they're first generation, their parents don't know by doing, that the price of college actually is less than what they're seeing in the newspaper. So I've been pushing um, uh, at, the, at the federal level to get the whole system simplified to the point where somebody would be able to tell when they're, a, when they're a high school student, parent of a high school student, what the true cost of college really would be for them. Can I have one more question? Sure. That's okay. Right. So um, uh, you also, uh, thank you. That was, that was interesting. I'd be really interested in your data. Um, the, uh, this sounds That's quite the come on. <laughs> You know, it just means that uh, loans have, and also I showed you that the loans are basically where they have been in real terms for at least 10 years. Um, so, no, student loans as a percentage of, of net income have not, have not been going up. I mean, uh, and, uh, there's been a lot of attention uh, for, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, the policy attention has been around what's going on in proprietary schools. I'm not saying there are not bad cases. There are certainly some bad cases. Um, so, in particular, some of the for-profit schools are charging very high tuitions and in some cases not giving much of an education back and essentially defrauding students into taking out very high debt loads that can't possibly be supported by the incomes they would earn coming out of those schools. So that's a separate, that's a fraud issue, which I, I think can be addressed and the, and, the, and the Department of Education is attempting to address it. But I, don't, I wouldn't want those fraud issues to drive the whole conversation about the typical institution. Right? That's not what UC Davis is doing, and that should not be driving how we think about loans and how the role they play in the University of California system. Yes, you had a question. Please. Hi, um, my name is Jessica. I'm a transfer student. I'm a junior major in political science. And I had a question for Senator Steinberg and actually he's at the combined together. Given the activism that you guys were talking about and how we need to get involved, what would you recommend? How would you go about that? Will we go first? No, you sir. You're the professional. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I'm a big believer uh, in activism that is focused. That is focused. And I think for yourself, for any student who's thinking about how to make a difference in life, it's not that in the end you can only focus on one thing because sure you have the capacity to focus on many things, but what do you want to get involved in? Do you, does, it burn a, does it burn in your gut uh, the fact that textbooks are so expensive? Does it really make you mad that uh, the legislature is not restoring higher education funding immediately? Do you have 
a passion for a political campaign where the focus will be to raise revenue to pay for education, higher education? I think it's a hard question to answer in the abstract unless you, and I'm just speaking as an example, any of you, um, think through what your passion is, because there's nothing worse than getting involved in something that you don't really care that much about, or that, you know, you care, but you're kind of doing it because it's obligatory, or somebody tells you that you should do it. The combination of intelligence and passion is a potent combination. And so I can tell you, for example, here's one. I'll give you one. Denny hadn't even mentioned this. We're often frustrated at the legislature that there aren't more alumni of the University of California who live in Republican districts yes. organizing, organizing to talk to, I never use the word pressure, <laughs> to talk to Republican legislators about the funding crisis in higher education. I, and it mystifies me because we know that, as the, as the graphs show from Professor Donarski, that you get a college education in this state, graduate from the University of California, probably a pretty good chance you're in a position either in business or community where you could have some real influence. And yet there is no, we talk about a master plan, there is no master plan for organizing uh, in a real way, the people who have benefited from a University of California education to come together and demand no more cut and restoration as quickly as possible, or getting involved in the Brown uh, uh, election effort in November to raise to help raise the revenue, so students uh, could have a real impact in talk about you know in politics. We uh, win elections, especially in city council races and assembly races, by going door to door. I've done it a number of times. It's actually the best part of campaigning. Maybe you could find out where in various parts of the state, you know, various alumni are located and knock on a door on a Saturday. <laughs> say, I'm, I mean, that may be a little off the beaten path, but not really. Who's organizing the alumni? to speak on behalf of the university, not in sort of the traditional way, but in an overt political way, demanding no more cuts. That's one idea. I have many others. But <laughs> so, um, I, I, if I, I, uh, obviously, I agree with absolutely everything, uh, everything the senator said. Uh, it is uh, working on something you're passionate about. And uh, of course, that presumes that you're thinking enough about what's going on in the world to find what it is that you're passionate about. Uh, and many college students don't do that, to be candid. <laughs> Sue was an organizer. Um, Barack Obama. I organized your secretary. Yeah, right. She, she organized <laughs> my secretary, right, back at Harvard. <laughs> she was great. Barack Obama was an organizer before he was my student. What Daryl's talking about, yeah, I taught him everything he knows. <laughs> Although he didn't learn everything I tried to teach him. <laughs> but what Daryl's talking about, what, what Daryl's talking about is developing and applying a set of skills as an activist. And there are sources on this campus, on the faculty, on the staff, who can help you with that? Who can help you with that? That's what I was talking about when I said, get a bag of tools that's going to make a difference uh, in, in, or on your path, that's going to make a difference on your path. Um, the other thing I'd say is any kind of movement uh, requires people to play lots of different roles. And in particular, <coughs> there's some people who are just great at yelling and screaming. And there's some people who are good at thinking about strategy, thinking about what the policy ends are, thinking about how do I get from A to Z. Now, you are among the elite. And if you're not among the 1% in income, you're definitely among the 1% one, 1 in terms of education opportunity. And so I would suggest 
to you that as you think about being an organizer, as you think about being an activist, that you are among the people best prepared to be thinking analytically about what we, what we need, uh, what we have to do. So you, gotta, so you can lead not just with your passion and with your body, but with your intelligence uh, and, uh, and, and really be leaders. Uh, in, in all of this. But the key, I think, is to think outside of the campus uh, to the real world. And I especially like Daryl's suggestion about working on the ballot initiative uh, this fall for new revenue. It's going to take a major, major political mobilization uh, for that to succeed. And there's a tremendous amount at stake for education, but for other programs as well. Great organization. I am. Well, I better figure out what I'm going to say. <laughs> and uh, my question is about the outlook for your bill on uh, digital textbooks. What are you expecting um, the resistance to be like in the legislature? And then also, um, for some of the education reforms for, for K-12, what are you expecting uh, resistance-wise from the CPA? Let me take the, the first question. If we are successful in articulating the facts around the instructional materials issue in the higher education system, we will win. If we're not, and the issue gets clouded by the opposition, it gets muddled, uh, we won't win. And so it's on us to make sure that uh, we're clear about what we're talking about not creating a different monopoly than what exists today, but using the, the innovation in California and create a competitive process and allow the faculty in all three systems to assure that whatever comes forward is of high quality, but can be sold to students at a much less expensive price. The other side will say, oh, we're, do, you know, we're doing a lot of this already, and there's the cost of production, and there's this, that, and the other. And if we're not clear that we're, we're talking about a competition that includes the publishers, we can do that, we, we will win. I'll tell you, the other, the, the other danger in terms of our success is what happens in the legislative process is you start out with a big idea, and if you're not careful, you are compromise down to something that isn't very meaningful. So I'm always very aware of that. Compromise is an absolutely essential part of governing. But there's a line with every big issue between an okay compromise and it not being worth doing. And I won't cross that line with this issue. This is big. I want to win. I want to win on behalf of the students. K-12. Your question is about the CTA. Um, I, I think uh, respectfully that um, I've had some battles with the CTA, by the way, uh, because I, um, I, I believe in seniority. I'm a warrior for the labor movement, but I also think when district layoffs are done on a pure seniority basis, that high poverty schools and, low, and kids from low income areas get the shaft because I've seen schools with half the teaching force laid off. It's not right. And I took them on, and uh, we didn't quite get there, but the, between the ACLU and my work and the courts, we're, we're moving in the right direction. But I don't think they're the problem. I really don't, uh, fundamentally, with education reform. I think the problem with education reform in this state, I'll be very brief about this, it is too political, polarized, and not analytical enough. You know, in the capital, you're either for the union or you're against the union. You're either for high standards or you're for vocational <coughs> education. It's not either or. It's not either or. I, I think, you know, the, the teacher evaluations and how we do them and whether we fire bad teachers is an important issue. But it's not the issue to me. The real issue for me is what we're doing to provide the basics early including preschool for kids. And in high school, again, I'm passionate about this idea that we should be teaching core academic courses in 10 different applied ways, 
consistent with the leading career pathways for young people. That would do more to end the dropout rate. That would do more to pre prepare kids for co young people for college. More to give the business community some confidence that we're actually educating young people with some workplace skills. That's the agenda. And so, but that's not sexy. So I guess not nearly as sexy as a big fight. So our job is to try to change the agenda and broaden it and build a different kind of coalition than just the people who are fighting with each other about a narrower set of issues. Time for a couple more questions. Yes, this one. I'm Wu Ping Tai. I'm with the Department of Economics at UC Davis. I was very struck by Chris Atwood telling us that students should be equipped with the sets of tools that they could do uh, plumbing well. And the second thing is to be able to defend and propose uh, a social architecture of a form that they can defend. Enough. And you also said that uh, it was important for the UC to develop the next generation of activists. By that, I, I, I think it could mean to propose and defend uh, social architecture that you think is what we should be aiming for. My question is, this is like asking the university, do you think a university is capable <coughs> of giving the students the tools to defend social architecture? If you look at the faculty, because social architecture are things that are much more controversial to evaluate than plumbing because it's the programming cost effective. So because of that, and the ranking process of universities and so forth, that's why we tend to give a much higher weight measuring what we can measure with no controversy, the plumbing. We, and less really to rank people on the basis of defending the social architecture. So that is the, the can the university, the university have an incentive to do Second set of tools. Right. For example, in my field, the, like Jeff Sachs just came out of a book, The Price of yes. Civilization. Some of my colleagues, many of my colleagues say, yes, you will get the Nobel Prize, but it will be the Nobel Prize in peace, peace. and not the Nobel Prize in economics. <laughs> so, I'm, uh, so I'm just a little. Uh, I'd like to see you on the Tuesday and Thursday moon. <laughs> <laughs> How the universities could supply the second set of tools right. and the institutional incentives that need to be put in place to uh, empower right. uh, the brave academic that is, that is a, for that is, social architecture. That is, that is a great and uh, quite profound question. Uh, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, I could do better if I had the right medication. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I would love to talk at length about this, but let me just, let, let, let me just be very pointed and very brief. Um, I had no interest in being a law school dean. Zero. I thought it was crazy that anybody, any professor would want, I mean, why would you want to, no interest. But for various reasons, I got tricked into coming to an interview. Right. And, uh, and the, First question the search committee asked me was, "Why do you want to be dean of Bolt Hall?" And I said, "I don't. I really don't want to be dean." <laughs> Second question they asked is, "What do you think is special about the mission of a great public law school as opposed to a private law school?" And I said, I don't know. Does the faculty think there's something special about the mission of a public? And the committee said, yes, they're not quite sure what it is. But, <laughs> but just, that question, just that question really led me on a train of thinking that caused me to leave Harvard to come to Berkeley. I think that the resistance that you just described of a faculty that is deeply committed to its discipline and conceives of its role as 
teacher and mentor narrowly and professionally, that doesn't distinguish you from a great private university. What, what should distinguish us is that even if it's incredibly difficult to understand the solution to this problem, the problem is so important to society that as a great public university, we're going to go after it. We're going to go after it. So the first thing I'd say to you is the difficulty of quantifying, the difficulty of falsifying, the difficulty, all of the intellectual difficulties involved in wrestling with complex social problems, those are all reasons why we should be going after it with an intentionality that distinguishes us from private universities. That's point number one. Point number two is uh, our students Our students require, I think, in order to be change agents, require more than a conventional curriculum. And that means that the way we reach in building, constructing our curriculum to give them the opportunities to, uh, to collect the tools, we need to be as intentional and as purposive in making available to them the kind of knowledge I'm talking about as they need to be in seizing it. Right? There ought to be a way for them to learn how to be organizers. There ought to be a way for them to learn how to be persuasive. And most important, this is my third point, one of the things that they should get out of studying these problems, one of the things you should learn is that if it's a really hard problem, there are no easy answers, by definition. And if you are absolutely sure you're right, I guarantee you, you're wrong. If you're absolutely sure you're right about a complex question and you fail to understand what's on the other side of the debate, I mean, even the, even the, the then, you, then you haven't studied it carefully enough. If you think there is absolutely <clears throat> nothing problematic with all the ideas and all the rhetoric that's spewing out of the Occupy movement, then you're not thinking analytically enough because a lot of it is right and a lot of it isn't right. And that's one of the things that I think great faculty can try to convey uh, to, to, to students, especially students as good as UC students. You gotta embrace the complexity because if you don't embrace the complexity, then you can't really work on anything important. Okay.
Irish retired official, about 11.5% more prison and corrections. So my question is this, what does that say about our values as a society? If you put it in that perspective, we looked at something that goes back to 2000. Let's go back further. <coughs> what does that say when our values, our goals, are less than they were before? And my question to you guys is this, do you feel like in a post-Proposition 13 era, do you feel like in the 21st century that we should abandon hope of having a free college system? That we should try and be affordable and accessible and compete within the private system, but abandon the dream of having something to be free and alternative? That's my question. All right, so we're going to give you very little time to answer because there's a class that apparently okay. meets on Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, all the, the panelists. Should I start so Dale can finish? That sounds great. Okay. Uh, all right. I will say somewhat controversially that I don't think I don't think it should be free. And the reason I don't think it should be free is because I believe in income redistribution. And uh, as I tell my students, when they graduate from law school, it was different. But when they graduate from law school, their median starting salary will be six times the median salary of California taxpayers. So taxing cannery workers in Fresno to subsidize their legal education is a dicey proposition. So I don't, so I, and just looking at the rest of the country, I just don't think free, free is, is either in the cards or morally available given other things that we should be putting our resources into. What you said about the evidence, what you said about the changes in budget and investment and how they speak to the changes in values is exactly the point that I was making. And so what's going to happen between now and that November vote on the ballot initiative is we're either going to have a debate about the policy plumbing or we're going to have a debate about values. We're to, and the question is whether or not California in decline is willing to embrace values that will reverse course. And, uh, and, and I want to note that this values problem, problem is not isolated to the condition of higher education. Right? This is, in general, a challenge to the entire opportunity agenda. And I don't think it's really going to be possible to save higher education without really building a movement to go after the values that are at stake with respect to the entire opportunity agenda. Uh so in terms of uh, higher education being free, it is free in some countries. Um, uh, it's been free in the U.S. in the past. One reason why it was sustainable in the past was that so few people went to college. Right? So it was, it was actually a big transfer from lower income people to the few people who did go to college. Um, uh, at this point, it could be free in the context of a radically changed um, taxation system. So given the, the social agreement we seem to have about the level and progressivity of taxes, it's not possible. But that's a conversation, and that's a political outcome. So if you think that should be different, then fight for it to be different. And then we could have a world potentially where it's free, but not where we are right now. I think it's important to be a practical idealist. Seem may, to may seem contradictory, but they really aren't. I, I don't think that uh, the 1960 master plan, uh, that part of it is achievable. And I don't think, and for the reasons that Professor Edley, Dean Edley laid out a moment ago, in some ways I don't think it's fair. Uh, I think the cost should be modest and reasonable. I am interested, however, in the kind of idea that I'm seeing uh, floated around a little bit and tend to look into it, about the idea of instead of imposing the cost on the student when they are a student, Instead to say, if you're a graduate of one of our public universities, that you pay a, after graduation, tax on the income you earn uh, to compensate the university back for what it is uh, for the education you receive. That's kind of an interesting idea to me. Uh, and depending on how it's done, uh, it, it may be a way we can uh, achieve in a way what it is uh, you describe, but uh, ensuring that, again, there is stable funding for the next generation and the next cohort of students. Thank you for having Please us all. Please help me. Thank you. Thank you.